Hi, my name is Irene Walton. Thank you so much for tuning in to Bites of History with Irene Walton. If I haven't mentioned it yet, I'm Irene Walton. Have you ever wondered how it made it to your table? Have you ever wondered how it made it to your shelf? If you love food, then this is the show for you. Bites of History with Irene. Hello, my friends, and happy beginning of the holiday season. We're starting it off early. We're starting it off fast. We're starting it off hard. (laughs) We're going to be talking about the history of Thanksgiving foods. So this is going to be the history of a couple of our classic, our favorite, our very beloved Thanksgiving foods, where they come from, if they've been, you know, around since the first Thanksgiving, which we're going to get into a little bit, and if they're more of a new addition. I want to start this episode by saying thank you to my patrons. I've seen a lot of new faces in there, and it's really, really exciting. You guys can become a patron too for only $2 a month. That is where I get a lot of my ideas, this podcast episode idea included. And also, I want to say thank you to Sam. She is sponsoring today's episode with a Venmo coffee. So thank you so much to Sam. She did ask if I wanted to get a boba. I'm just not the biggest boba gal. So I got a coffee. So thank you so much, Sam. If you guys like to sponsor an episode or contribute via Venmo, you can go to Venmo.com or Venmo.com. You can open the Venmo app and my handle is right here. It's at Irene Dash Walton. So thank you guys so much for that. Now we are going to thank our sources as always, because it is hugely important and I wouldn't be able to do these episodes without all of the research that I'm able to gather. So thank you to native-land.ca, history.com, cnn.com, food52.com, vox.com, bhg.com, which is Better Homes and Gardens, mentalfloss.com, and bustle.com. Thank you guys so much. I do want to start this podcast episode off with being very, very clear. I know that I am living on stolen land. I know that we all are in, in the United States. I also want to say I did research this and I did my best, but I am by no means, and I'm sure we all are aware of this, (laughs) I am by no means a real, like, you know, degree holding historian. This is just what I was able to gather so that I could give a brief uh, summary of the first Thanksgiving, what that looks like and what that actually means. I know that we are all taught something very, very different in school growing up in the United States, like what Thanksgiving and the Native American and coloni- European colonizer relationship looked like. So I would just like to say that where I'm recording this right now is recorded to be on the native land of the Chumash Tonga indigenous people. Um, If you guys want to see what land you might be living on, that's that first website that I listed called native-land.ca. It gives uh, like a rough estimate of the indigenous people and where they lived. And if you, you can like put your address in and it tells you what land you might be living on. And I just think that's really incredible. So again, I don't know the whole detailed history of the first Thanksgiving, but I did just want to acknowledge that. I am aware that Europeans came and colonized a a land that was already doing great and had its own people there. So I just wanted to say that right up top. So let's dive into what the first Thanksgiving looked like. And then we're going to talk about the foods that they had, as well as what foods we have now and where those traditions came from. Okay, so let's start in 1620. The European colonizers are coming across the Atlantic Ocean to steal some land. (laughs) from the Native Americans. Now, the first relationship that is built between the Wampanoag Native Americans and the European colonizers is actually one of the only peaceful ones that is on record of existing. For 50 years, they had a pretty solid relationship is what I saw. So the Wampanoag Native Americans were super helpful in helping the colonizers kind of figure stuff out, how to harvest food, how to, you know, kind of just exist. They needed a lot of help and the Wampanoag Native Americans were very helpful in that. And so a year later, when the colonizers first harvest was successful in 1621, everyone was so excited. This was their first corn harvest. Um, Everyone was so excited. And this was the quote unquote first Thanksgiving was them being super stoked about this autumn harvest. 
So they had a giant feast and this feast lasted for about three days. And as I'm sure you're wondering, you're like, oh my gosh, what food besides corn did they have? And that's what I was wondering as well. And that's why we're both here <laughs> listening, watching and telling you the story. But in terms of what was on the table for this first Thanksgiving, it's definitely going to look different than we may be used to today. Now, there is a firsthand account of Governor William Bradford saying that there was a like plenty of wild fowl and wild turkey. So it does look like there may have been turkey at the first Thanksgiving. However, Colleen Wall, a culinary historian, actually has a better guess that it was probably like goose, duck and pigeon instead of actual turkey, but it was said that there was turkey. Who's to know? Whenever I am able to go back in time, you'll be the first that I <laughs> that I fill in. So while there may have been turkey on the first Thanksgiving table, there was also a lot of stuff that we are not used to seeing on our Thanksgiving tables now. Because this was in the Northeast, there was a lot of shellfish. We saw lobster. We saw fish. We saw eel and oysters probably being served at this table. The vegetables that would have been at the first Thanksgiving are the corn that we saw being harvested successfully for the first time. There would probably have been peas and spinach. And it's likely that the colonizers brought over like cabbage and carrots from England that they had cultivated as well. So that obviously got me thinking if there was eel and there were, you know, peas being served, what how did we get to where we are? How did we get to mashed potatoes, cranberry sauce, sweet potatoes with mini marshmallows, you know? Well, it turns out potatoes hadn't even come over from South America yet. They weren't really able to do cranberry sauce because they had basically no sugar left over from the, you know, super long ship ride. They couldn't have made any gravy because there weren't any flour mills to grind up all of the wheat. And there were no little mini marshmallows to put on top of our casseroles because we hadn't figured out how to grind up bones to get their collagen yet. Gross. So let's figure out where some of our favorites did come from. Now, this is going to be very controversial yet brave of me to share. I love jellied cranberry sauce. I love it. I love it. I love it. Mm. I know some people don't. And that's wrong, but okay. Now, while there have been instances of seeing cranberry sauce in a historical record as far back as 1672, it didn't become a staple until 1864 when General Ulysses S. Grant served it to his Union soldiers at the Petersburg Battle. During the siege of Petersburg, sorry. <laughs> and that's where we see it becoming a little more common because sugar is definitely more plentiful than it was in the 1620s. And the fact that it was served during such a publicized time in 1864, which I know seems like a million years ago, but it was the Civil War and things were being talked about and written about. And uh, so it just became more common about 200 years after we see the first mention of it. And cranberries are were kind of an elusive part of our Thanksgiving meal because they're only really grown in five states. They're grown in Wisconsin, Massachusetts, New Jersey, Oregon, and Washington state. Because it it's so finicky because they need to be in a very high water area because they grow in bogs. I don't know if you guys have seen the ocean spray commercials, but they're very cute. They grow in like basically pools and they also need to be in really cold environments. So yeah, there's, there's a lot of, you know, like bodies of water in the South, but it's too hot there. And then there's a lot of places where it's cold, but there's not enough water. So these are the, just the, like the perfect little places, the perfect little states for these berries to grow. So it's already kind of hard to make it happen. But Marcus Yerman had other plans. Marcus Yerman is a former lawyer turned cranberry bog purchaser. And he is the like impetus for what would become ocean spray. Now, Marcus is working with his little cranberry bog. He's very excited very happy, totally loves it. And then he's like, okay, here's the gag. I can only sell these berries for a month and a half out of the year because their season is only six weeks long. Now it is in October to December, which is why it makes sense that we kind of focus our cranberry vibes around the holidays because that's when they used to be available. However, in 1940, Marcus was like, that's not working for me anymore. We're going to make these available all year round. We're going to start canning these bad boys. Get it going. So then we see the absolute magic of our jellied ocean spray cranberry log um, <laughs> become nationally available in 1941. Now, something kind of cool about the cranberry sauce can is it's actually canned upside down, if you've ever noticed. And that is so it's it's just for ease of serving so that it's more likely to stay in its cylindrical shape. 
But yeah, so in 1941, at least something good happened that year. We start getting our jellied cranberry sauce available nationwide. And just some quick fun facts about our jellied cranberry log. It takes 220 cranberries to make one can of our jellied cranberry sauce. And and listen, hey, listen, listen up. Oh, the jellied cranberry sauce is actually three times more popular than the whole cranberry cranberry sauce because for every one can of the whole cranberry sauce, three jellied cranberry sauces are sold. So do it that way you will. Now, while there are little spikes throughout the year in sales for Ocean Spray's jellied cranberry sauce, they do sell about 80% of all of their jellied sales during uh, during the holidays, starting around Thanksgiving, having a big spike in Christmas as well. And that's just the word on our cranberry sauce history of Thanksgiving. I, again, I love the jellied cranberry sauce. Leave in the comments down below if you like the jellied sauce or the regular, or if you just don't like cranberries at all, that's okay too. Okay, now this is a classic. Pumpkin pie. Was pumpkin pie served at the first Thanksgiving? No, of course not. There were likely pumpkins and squashes and gourds of sorts that were served. However, since there wasn't sugar, like we talked about, there wasn't flour to make the crust, butter was a whole other thing. It wasn't in pie form. The first time we see pumpkin pie even sort of mentioned is in 1796 in the book American Cookery, which is highly regarded as the first ever American cookbook written by Miss Amelia Simmons. Shout out. We love a female writer in 1796. Incredible. Now in this, there was a recipe for a pumpkin pudding, which had like nutmeg and allspice in it, and it was served in a crust. So this is like our first ever idea of what a pumpkin pie might be. And since the pumpkin season is also happening in this same kind of Oct September, October, November window, that's why it became such a popular holiday treat. I myself am not super partial to pumpkin pie, but a good bite now and then never hurt anybody. Um, so that's where our pumpkin pie tradition comes from. Now let's move on to green bean casserole. First of all, are you a fan? Secondly, why? <laughs> no, I actually love green beans. I'm just not the biggest fan of green bean casserole, but have you ever wondered where it came from? Because I sure have. Now, this one I'm excited to share because it sort of opens up like a little Pandora's box of stuff I'm really excited to get into in future episodes where brands would try to bring awareness to their brand by just creating recipes, but making sure they include a bunch of their branded stuff in it, which we still see now. It's like not a surprising thing at all. Like if you look on the back of a Rice Krispies, you know, box, it's going to say, here's how to make Rice Krispies treats, get this brand of Rice Krispies. And that's great. And that's exactly what Campbell's Soup did in 1955. Dorcas Riley, who was a test kitchen chef and home economist that was working in the Camden, New Jersey Campbell's Kitchens, was tasked to come up with a really simple and really branded way to get home cooks in the kitchen and using Campbell's products. So the first ever recipe that we see for green bean casserole is from Miss Riley coming out of the Campbell's test kitchen. It includes Campbell's cream of mushroom soup, green beans, milk, soy sauce, pepper, and French's French fried onions that go on top for the crunchy crunchy. Now, the reason that this particular recipe gained so much popularity around Thanksgiving is because the 1955 Associated Press published it in an article that came out around Thanksgiving. So this became like the thing people made for Thanksgiving, which is just crazy to me. And the tradition stuck. It most certainly did. I guarantee like half of you guys are going to have green bean casserole on your table. And actually about 30% of all of Campbell's cream of mushroom sales happen around Thanksgiving for this exact reason. Now, if you like me, were wondering what the bar situation, the old vino sitch might have been at the first Thanksgiving. It is not likely that they had, you know, all these beautiful selections of wine and cocktails and everything that we do now. But they did probably have this like fermented um, pumpkin and parsnip drink that could probably get them drunk. There, It's also believed that they may have had some hard cider, but nothing too, too crazy, although I'm sure they were able to, you know, imbibe one way or another. So that was the alcohol situation at our first Thanksgiving. Now, I know we already touched on if turkey was at the first Thanksgiving, and while it may or may not have been, depending on the actual, like, written account versus what some food historians believe, who knows? But there is a reason it has stuck around as such 
like the Thanksgiving food because it's really practical. Honestly, turkeys are pretty easy to raise. They're usually really big. They can feed a lot of people and they're cheaper than geese. So it's like it's been a very common kind of practical thing to have at the Thanksgiving table. And the colonizers were actually pretty used to eating fowl for big holidays anyway, like geese and stuff. So it was kind of, you know, it kind of just stuck around as like the holiday meat. (laughs) Turkey became such a staple for Thanksgiving that Alexander Hamilton was actually quoted as saying, no U.S. citizen will refrain from eating turkey on Thanksgiving Day. Now, here's a final little note that I just thought would be fun to kind of research because I've always been so curious. Why do we eat so early on Thanksgiving? Now, there are some historical nods to medieval times, actually, as to why we're eating so early, because the sun was still up so we could see what we were preparing. We could, you know, actually enjoy what we were eating while we were looking at the food and at each other. So it was better to do it in the daytime where there was still sun out before there was electricity. And also, people were getting up real early the next day. So the earlier they went to bed and had their food settled in their system, the better. And that's kind of the same for us. Because Thanksgiving is such a highly trafficked day, literally, and like on the roads and in the house, it's sort of just better that like, pretty soon after guests arrive, we start eating so that then we can retire and start cleaning dishes and letting our food settle and, you know, kind of just sit down and relax. So the 3 p.m. Thanksgiving dinner, (laughs) daytime dinner is not the craziest thing in the world. And it seems like we've kind of been doing it for a very long time. Now, the other thing is because there are usually a lot of football games being played on Thanksgiving Day, it's it's thought, it's theorized that our dinners got earlier and earlier so that we wouldn't be missing any of the game. Oh my gosh. Okay, you guys, I hope you liked our little Thanksgiving episode. Please, please, please leave in the comments what your Thanksgiving traditions are and what you're doing this year. I'm so excited to hear about it. Thank you again to my patrons. If you guys want to check out the Patreon, you can join for only $2 and you can give me all of these wonderful holiday podcast ideas because I am having such a wonderful time learning all these fun little traditions and where they came from. Please make sure to like this video and comment down below. You can subscribe to my channel with that big red button. Turn on that notification bell so you know when I post, but just a tip, it's Tuesdays and Fridays. Um, And I just hope you all have the most wonderful, happy, safe Thanksgiving. Make sure you drink a lot of water that helps your food digest. And if you're drinking, drink very responsibly and do not drive. And I just, I'm wishing you the best. And I'm really excited for this holiday season with you. I think we're going to learn a lot. I can't wait to take a bite out of history with you next week when we talk about something else interesting I haven't chosen yet. Okay, love you. Bye-bye. Bye.